Hello and welcome to Views on News. I am Jawad Hami. Pakistan's finance minister Isaak Dar has once again categorically reiterated that Pakistan is not going to default and the government is taking measures in order to uh, repay the loans. He also said that it is because of the political instability and the politics of agitation and the rumor mongering by Pakistan that he saw that is not helping the country, let alone the economy. And uh, he also said uh, that the actual of value of rupee against the greenback should be 190 rupees per dollar and that is because of the political instability in the country that the actual price of uh, the dollar is not being reduced and he also said that uh, the benefit of the reduced fuel prices globally would be passed on to the public there are certain positive developments also uh, today the Pakistan stock exchange rallied and there was a little bit of strength shown by the rupee against the greenback uh, today. At the same time, the Azri government has announced a 15% exemption on custom duty on Pakistan's rice and both the countries are also making a lot of efforts in order to increase the trade volume between each other. Now, specifically talking about how detrimental is the politics of agitation and a rumor mongering by Pakistan Tariq Saf and the opposition to the country and overall state of economy will be talking about this aspect and how uh, a charter of economy repeatedly talked about uh, by the PMLN or whether it was in the opposition now in the government uh, will be helping uh, to stabilize Pakistan's overall economic outlook. We'll be talking about this aspect uh, also and we are honored to have been joined in the studio by Mr. Fahim Sardar. He is senior policy specialist, senior economist, is associated with a strategic policy planning cell at National Security Division, Government of Pakistan. And also, we are being joined on the Skype by Dr. Ikramul Haq. He is a taxation expert. Uh, both of you, thank you very much for your time, for being on uh, Views on News. Let me begin the discussion with you, uh, Mr. Fahim Sardar. Now, uh, categorically, once again, Finance Minister has said that Pakistan is not uh, going to default. It is all about the rumor mongering and the politics of agitation by the opposition that is uh, causing that misperception. Your take regarding that. Uh, indeed, uh, the Finance Minister is very uh, positive that uh, till that time comes in when the repayment is due, Pakistan will definitely do it. Thank you for having me. Uh, I've been saying for quite a while that there is no default for Pakistan and uh, that's that was my assessment. That is uh, going to remain my assessment and I'm happy to hear that that's what we're talking about. The finance minister has said that there is no default, no, no chance of a default and I have to explain something here. Uh, what's being quoted in is a credit default swap rate. The credit default swap is a market mechanism, market product used in the secondary market in bonds and particularly the debt market where it is a, it is a reversal of the um, investment and one pays to the other in one circumstance and the reverse is done in the opposite circumstance. I'm trying to keep this as simple as possible. The person who actually brought this product into light was a person by the name of Michael Burry, who predicted the 2008 US financial crisis. Now, uh, we have to be very clear about what a market product is and what a credit rating is. They're two different things. A sovereign credit rating is something different, which, which is done by PACRA, uh, so which is done by Moody's, which is done by Fitch, which is done by the Chinese Dagong Credit Rating Agency. And a market mechanism, a market price is something different of a product. So here I think we've got some lines have uh, crossed or something has happened where a market activity in which uh, the credit default swap rate, it took a spike. Why, why did it spike? It spiked because of a dip in the bond markets. Why did the bonds dip? Because of, a, of certain news which was not particularly accurate. So that has caused a lot of unnecessary market turbulence. You cannot equate one with the other. 
These are facts. Right. Now, uh, there is another development. <coughs> when we specifically talk about this credit default swap, as you have already explained um, uh, pretty much in detail. Now, uh, when there was a spike, that was about 92.53% previously yeah. uh, uh, during the last week. But now, uh, today, it has reduced to 71.64. That is another good sign? Of course, it's a good sign. Because, I mean, uh, um, here, uh, allow me to just go back. I'll just retrace my steps. When we talk about a credit default swap rate, or that is a market price. That is a market pricing of a certain uh, swap rate. Th this has got nothing to do with, uh, it can be construed as, as a default uh, indicator, but it's a, of that particular bond. But it is not a, an indicator of that underlying country. I want to stress again, a sovereign credit rating is something completely different. different. Uh, a rating uh, or a market price of a derivative. This is a derivative pricing. By, I mean, I, I just, I'm still right. surprised we're talking about derivatives all of a sudden. Uh, the, the, the pricing of a derivative is being attributed to a country. So you know that that sort of uh, doesn't help right. much. Right. Let's uh, take uh, Dr. Ikramul Haq's point of view on this. Uh, Dr. Ikramul Haq, uh, finance minister, is very optimistic that Pakistan is not going to default and it is going to uh, repay the loans. Your take regarding this, and especially when given, uh, as you have heard, uh, Mr. Fahim Sardar saying that it is a derivative market price and the probability of actual default uh, has nothing to do with this. Uh, Dr. Ikramul Haq, unfortunately, we can't hear you. Can you kindly unmute? Do Dr. Do Dr. Ikram, can you hear me now? Okay, we'll try to go back to Dr. Ikram. Uh, Mr. Fahim Sadar, would you elaborate a little more on this particular thing? Uh, what I understand from this is uh, um, uh, th that it is uh, not the probability of the actual default. It is basically the insurance, that derivative market price that you have just already allu alluded to. Okay, uh, the word that you've used, insurance, is being used in the market, which is just uh, a very, uh, it is basically to uh, understand what a CDS is. CDSs are highly complex exotic products. They are not representative of, if there's a company ABC, it issues bonds and on those bonds there is a CDS. It's already a derivative. Now, if uh, there is a, a, a spike in the CDS rate of this bond, does that mean this bond, if this bond goes down or up, does the company go down or up? It can be argued, yes, but this is not how it's done. This is not how it's used. I mean, I'm, I'm a little uh, surprised here. Yes, the credit rating of this company is if it's uh, investor grade or junk grade, whatever it is, that's a separate issue. These things are loosely linked with each other, but uh, we have to really draw lines. We have to, and we have to really talk about things that sort of make sense to us. So the rating agencies you already mentioned, including the Moody's, when they give the credit rating, um, uh, that uh, does that depict to uh, an actual default? It is a it is far more accurate depiction, and they did uh, uh, ding Pakistan in the recent past. I take that very seriously. When and, and and we have to now once again be factual. We also have to see what the Chinese Dagong credit rating agency is saying because we have to look at all the credit raters, not just, uh, let's say, American specific or French specific or English specific. We should look at them. We should look at what China is saying as well. Because just this is a slightly off topic, but w China was the Dagong credit rating agency was the first rating agency that, <coughs> that uh, downgraded the US, after which Fitch downgraded the US. That's a serious matter when a credit rating agency downgrades a sovereign rating. That's something different. If the CDS has come down from, let's say, uh, 75 to 71 percent, I mean, uh, what does that tell you? It's telling you an indicator of how the market is adjusting to itself. But that's so the fluctuation. Yeah, exactly. And if, if one month later, if it's down to 40, 40 I mean, I mean that's, that's actually proving my point. It is a very serious thing to have a spike in any rate or a dip in any rate, an abnormal thing. However, we have to differentiate between this is a market activity, this is a fundamental activity in the underlying principle. You cannot mix the two because that's where things get a little, uh, a little hazy. 
For example, just to give a very simple example, if on the Pakistan Stock Exchange, as you mentioned, today uh, prices went up uh, and uh, volume was pretty decent. But if the price of a particular share, I won't take any names, if it suddenly dips, does that mean that company has been destroyed? It can indicate that, but that's not what it means. One has to look at the facts, and this is like a point-to-point -point specific thing. It's not a derivative. Derivatives are, as the name suggests, they're derived from right. an underlying asset, which is based on another asset. Right. Uh, when uh, we specifically talk about uh, the rate of the dollar against the, uh, the rate of rupee against the greenback, mm -hmm. and uh, finance minister has said that it is because of the political instability, whereas the actual value of uh, rupee against the dollar is 190, but it is because of the political instability and politics of agitation of the opposition uh, that the actual price is not being reached. Uh, yes, that is pr uh, particularly true and it goes for everyone, not just one or two uh, sides. Uh, I'll just once again, I'll retrace my steps. In economics, it is extremely important for the people who understand economics to talk about economics. And if I were to talk about quantum physics all of a sudden, just because I like it, I'm pretty sure I'll start making mistakes. I don't know quantum physics. I do know a little bit about finance and the markets because I've spent my whole life in them. So it is advisable for everyone, everyone to just please stick to your speciality and talk about it. What's happened in, in Pakistan in the past 10 years is everyone has become an economics expert. And they're talking about things which uh, I, I've, uh, sometimes I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little stunned. Uh, I've come on so many programs. I, we've started the discussion. I said that's factually not correct. Right. It's factually 180 degrees. So. Uh, I'm just talking about facts, and that's what we need to focus on. And if, if uh, one of the biggest, most powerful weapons, weapons is the word I'm going to use, in the market is information. Information, whether it's true or untrue, it fluctuates the market. For example, when, uh, when it came out that there is too much supply during COVID of oil, all of a sudden, the futures prices on, uh, on the major uh, futures exchanges of oil went into negative. And that was not particularly true. It was just a, 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 a huge, sl uh, a heavy sluggishness in the oil market. But it, the information became so, uh, everything started echoing each other. So that, that's a matter of creating perceptions. And that yes. is what exactly has been mentioned by Finance Minister Isagdar also. And perceptions can lead to reality. So that is, that is quite true. So, I mean, I am a very cautious person. I've been in the markets. I know how the markets react. What, what you say can become true. Right. Uh, Dr. Dr. Uh, Ikramul Haq, what's your take? Our finance minister is very optimistic. Pakistan is going to repay its loans and it's not going to default. Your take? I'm 100% uh, sure that Pakistan is not going to default because proper uh, uh, arrangements have been made. Time and again, the uh, State Bank Governor has also mentioned that we will meet all our obligations on the external front. But as we know, political instability triggers off many things, and one of that is that there is a lot of rumors around. And because people don't understand the fundamentals, they start saying that the threat of uh, some kind, perceived threat of default is imminent. But it is not a reality at all. We are not going to default at all. We never defaulted in paying our external obligations. And every time, uh, whenever there is uh, any kind of uh, external obligation, uh, always uh, prior arrangements are made and uh, they are very clear. Uh, having said that, I'm sure that we all know that our debt sustainability and other fundamental issues or structural reforms are always uh, have to be debated frankly and objectively. Over the period of time, we have accumulated a lot of debt, that is a reality. And uh, last regime, you know, uh, in a very short span of time, they have accumulated much uh, larger stock of uh, debts than any other government at any point of time. So at that point of time, everybody was who uh, knows the uh, position was asking that uh, we should be prudent and we should uh, debate this issue 
objectively, not blaming one single government or uh, uh, it's a country challenge and it's a challenge that is faced by the country as a whole. So I think uh, we should refrain from uh, talking of uh, default or any possibility of any uh, default in the future. But at the same time, I would suggest that uh, we should also talk about that how we should come out of these dead shackles and how we should put the economy back. And if political instability continues and if uh, politics of protest continues, then uh, there are chances that uh, we are not giving uh, due attention to our economy in the sense that uh, we need to plan, we need to strategize, we need to uh, improve our efficiency, our productivity, uh, and we also to increase our uh, national wealth and GDP so that we can uh, tackle these issues uh, objectively and pragmatically. So this is my take uh, on this issue that uh, there is nothing to be worried or create panic about and there is no uh, and I fully agree that there is no threat of any kind of uh, default on the part of uh, Pakistan. Right, your point is well taken, Dr. Ikramul Haq. I'll have to take a short break. And after we return from the break, we'll be talking about the debt burden that had been building over the number of years on Pakistan, especially when we talk about the previous tenure of the Pakistan Tariqe <coughs> Insaf government. For that, stay tuned. Welcome back to Views on News. We are now joined by another participant, Dr. Vakar Ahmed, Joint Executive Director, Sustainable Development Policy Institute. Dr. Vakar Ahmed, thank you very much for your time also for being on Views on News. Finance Minister, uh, Mr. Isakdar, is uh, very positive that Pakistan is not going to default and it is because of the rumor mongering and the politics of agitation. Pakistan Tariqe Saf is trying to take the political mileage and advantage of uh, your take regarding this, sir. Yes, thank you very much for having me. Um, I think Finance Minister was uh, clear in his argument and the fact that data at this incoming data available at the central bank's website clearly shows uh, that the inflows, expected inflows, are fairly safe to cover immediate uh, payments which would be maturing during the next month and a half. And the payments would also, the inflows would also cover our, the current account uh, deficit as well, which, by the way, has been narrowing down uh, over time. A lesser uh, uh, import bill uh, yeah, consecutively over the past uh, two months or so, which certainly reduces uh, risk, uh, any speculative risk uh, going forward. Right, to Dr. Vakar Ahmed, when we, uh, when we talk about the uh, value of the rupee against the dollar, Finance Minister says it is because of the political instability. The actual price should be around 190. Because of the political instability, uh, it is not reaching its actual price, and that causes the misperception and lack of confidence in the financial markets. I would uh, side to that view, but I think there are uh, important arguments uh, other than the political instability, because you see several other countries 
political instability as well, even in the developed world. When a developing country like Pakistan has several other factors, one of them being, of course, uh, that uh, after COVID, you are certainly seeing a surge in travelers going out of the country and demanding uh, uh, the greenback, the foreign currencies. You have seen increased outflow of uh, people trying to visit Saudi Arabia, as well as, of course, the Western countries. So the demand from travelers, demand from students wishing to go abroad has increased. Then, of course, you also have this backlog of uh, LCs which importers have to make, they are also demanding dollars from the open market. Uh, thirdly, of course, given that uh, you have been facing uh, unprecedented inflation due to the external factors, uh, due to that, you have small savers trying to conserve their savings into U.S. dollars as well. So I think it is the economic fundamentals that the economy faces which are inducing this pressure on rupee, which, by the way, one hopes that as soon as there is some decision on the ninth review, uh, a lot of these pressures on rupee will subside. Right. Uh, Dr. Vakarim, I've been talking about the debt burden on Pakistan, especially uh, during the PTI uh, government. Uh, uh, they uh, borrowed record loans from external sources. Uh, now that put an additional burden on uh, economy as well. Uh, during this year's budget, we saw that there was an increase in debt servicing uh, that increased from 35% to 45%. Now, when a Pakistan that he can saw particularly talks about, we really have to take a stock of the policy policies which were implemented by Pakistan that he can solve also, which was detrimental uh, to the overall state of economy in Pakistan as well. Uh, yes, partly uh, uh, correct, given that Pakistan Tariq and staff faced a time when a pandemic uh, breakout out for easy borrowing. You had debt available on concessional terms. You could also roll over existing debt. You could find new lenders as well uh, during the pandemic times. There was a sympathetic view of IMF as well, which allowed you rapid finance facility. So g seeking and getting debt during those years was much easier than it is now. And certainly once debt was available, uh, uh, you continue to take it given that you wanted to augment your foreign exchange reserves in the central bank. Now, uh, whether it was a good strategy or a not so good strategy, of course, this, uh, this is something which is up for debate. Now, Dr. Vakar Ahmed, one more thing. Uh, the uh, government says the Pakistan Tariq and Saf uh, backtracked from the conditions it agreed with IMF. Uh, that also happened to be very detri uh, detrimental for the overall state of economy. Your take on this? Yes, I, I, think, I think this happened twice during the uh, previous government's tenure. The previous government wanted to seek further time to see uh, if, for example, politically they could implement the tough conditions of IMF, they wanted to buy time. Uh, I wouldn't say that they backtracked because they never said that we will backtrack, but they were, uh, I, I can still sort of safely say that they, uh, in, in, they, they took too long to decide whether to uh, implement some of the uh, asks of IMF in the tax space, in the energy space, in the privatization space. And of course, that didn't go well. It also delayed several of our reviews as well. I sincerely hope that this government will not, of course, make the same mistake and the same delays will not occur in the ninth review. So, so when we uh, talk about Charter of Economy, a concept talked about repeatedly by uh, PMLN when it was in the opposition and now also by Finance Minister and the Prime Minister himself. So um, as the Finance Minister also says that economy shouldn't be politicized, don't you think it's the time when Pakistan is faced with uh, uh, so many crises, especially after uh, having been hit by devastating floods that accrued over $30 billion of losses and damages, all the stakeholders the political parties should uh, sit together and chalk out uh, the charter of economy for the larger interest of the country. Absolutely agreed. I think this is a need of the hour. We need our parties to sit down uh, and decide the minimum uh, set of reform agendas going forward. I think Prime Minister will have to take a lead. Uh, immediately an all-parties conference should be called 
on this emergency uh, economic situation to which the army chief has also alluded in his speech today that there is an economic emergency which needs to be addressed and i agree with you that all parties should be invited around the table to discuss those minimum reforms uh, which which uh, every party can agree to and i don't think that this should be a difficult task given that i uh, pti had signed up to the same uh, extended fund facility eff of uh, international monetary fund which the pmln also subscribed to when they came to par the broad contours of charter of the economy are already present uh, on the table right dr vakar am a joint executive director sustainable development policy institute thank you very much for your time for being on views on news really appreciate uh, that uh, mr sadar when we talk about charter of the economy uh, it's the time as there is uh, an economic emergency in the country don't you think when uh, as dr vakar am also said that uh, uh, prime minister should be taking the lead in order to make all the stakeholders come to the uh, table and choke out that charter of the economy but prime minister and finance minister have been repeatedly saying let sit together and chalk this one out what about the other side if it's not uh, willing to sit and is rather going for the politics of agitation rather um if if that is the case then they, then a proposal should be made and sent to them that's what i would do uh, you just make something make something logical something acceptable something uh, you see the charter of economy is basically a multi-layered process in which all the parties have to agree to broad things in the short term then this goes to the medium term then goes to the long term as we progress in time you start looking at more finer things one of the first things for example that we need to look at is uh, road blockages or violence in economic areas or protests in economic areas you cannot allow no country allows protests to happen in economic areas because that basically slows down your economy so why not agree on the things that you can agree on where everybody is uh, where it's a national interest so i think it's more a question of i think let's just take the first step and just move forward and it's it's not something uh, uh, to be very honest because i've worked on it uh, it's not something which is so um, divisive it's not something that is so difficult to sell to someone it's it's more a question of how you structure it and the simplest way to do this is and and i've been through the the basic structure that you break it up into time wise and you break it up into basic things and then you leave the slightly more refined slightly more cds issues for the later times not for the immediate right i'll come back to this i'll uh, try to understand that what could be the salient features or the ideal features sure. of this charter of economy uh, so dr ikramul haq when we talk about the debt burden on pakistan we see a record borrowing of loans during the pakistan tehreek and saf uh, government uh, don't you think that happened to be an additional burden on uh, pakistan's overall state of economy Uh, certainly because uh, all of us were warning that uh, the way we are borrowing recklessly is going to create a lot of problem because at that point of time we know covid-19 situation was there and uh, economy as a whole for the first time after many decades went into negative as well so the emphasis was not on growth but uh, <coughs> keep on borrowing Uh, in unfavorable circumstances, maybe there I am giving uh, some allowance to them. But my question is that if we uh, are not concerned with growth, then no government uh, will be able to charter of democracy or after charter of democracy to charter of economy. The major thing is that we should have a charter for economy as well. What is a charter for economy to me is that we should come up with uh, concrete proposals. that we have to have sustainable growth for at least a decade the way uh, we have uh, our population growing and we have youth pulse at least we uh, have to have lot of investment say 20% of gdp to provide uh, over 2 million jobs annually to uh, young people so this is a kind of uh, uh, challenge that every uh, party above party lines should have to consider that this is future of pakistan if 70 years are barren years for pakistan unfortunately at this point of time if we talk economically then we should have to concentrate on the next 25 years because pakistan at 
should be a vibrant economy and we should uh, provide jobs to our young and other uh, people seeking employment. For that, uh, you need a lot of investment. Because investment, we talk less and we talk, uh, of course, we should also talk about other things, fundamental uh, structure reforms. But bottom line is that uh, investment should come. And investment will only come if we will have political stability. All the parties should decide that the next 25 years of Pakistan should be uh, years of investment, should be fear of peace. There should be elections, whosoever win, uh, he should rule. But uh, with the condition that in no way they will disrupt the policy of growth and investment and giving relief to the people. If they come to this agenda, only then we can hope that in the next 25 years, Pakistan and 100 will be a prosperous country. Otherwise, the kind of ad hocism and the kind of policies we have adopted so far are not going to yield any uh, fruits to us. So my humble request to all of the uh, political parties of Pakistan is that at least they should consider that the next 25 years of Pakistan are very crucial. When a country becomes at 100, it should be, as we have seen in China, that when they were celebrating 50 years of their party rule, they were very happy that in the world of uh, this turbulent world, they have uh, established uh, themselves a power to be reckoned with. Pakistan was very good in earlier periods when we have been going for five years, 10 years planning. But now, political instability as well as lack of planning and uh, dedication uh, Dr. Ikramul Haq, your point is well taken. When you talk about um, lots of investment that is required, uh, particularly for Pakistan to stabilize the overall economy, uh, political instability happens to be very crucial for that. So at the same time, we see that the government is giving a repeated invitation to all the stakeholders to sit and chalk out a charter of economy. What is the viable and the most possible solution when the other side is not uh, ready to concede to that invitation? I think it is the responsibility of the government uh, in office. It is the responsibility of the opposition to be a shadow cabinet. If they are not playing their part, then the government should play its part and it should come up with viable solutions. And it should ask the uh, people of Pakistan that if they vote for this, only then they can ensure that Pakistan will stabilize economically. So stabilization of uh, a country depends on how you bring uh, changes and not only words. So, uh, to my mind, uh, actions speak uh, louder than words. So, also at the government in the short term, they should bring some concrete policy measures showing that the other uh, party if is not responding because in a democracy they say that opposition always is a party in waiting for power. But if they fail to uh, perform their role, then the government should uh, at least uh, provide something uh, very, very concrete and tell the people that this is our agenda and if you vote for us, we will continue it. Otherwise, uh, there is no way that we keep on uh, uh, expecting that the other party will come on the table. Uh, of course, uh, we, sh we should be like this, we should pray for that. But at the same time, we should not uh, give up or we should not defer our own work just for the sake of that. Uh, right, Mr. Sadar, already we were talking about the Charter of Economy, as you already <coughs> mentioned, that it should be time-phased. Um, uh, what could be the ideal um, uh, salient features of that Charter of Economy when we talk about the short term, the immediate term, the midterm, and the long term? Um, what, what, we, what can be done is simply that you start off with something that affects everybody immediately. That's uh, basically the stoppage of economic activity. Any kind of protests, they should not allow, everybody has to agree to this, that there should not be, uh, there should be no effect on economic activity, number one. Number two, uh, the simplest thing that can be done is to just create a structure of coordination, that these will be the parties, uh, there, ha there has to be, uh, it's not about the government or the opposition, it's about the government, it's about the opposition, it's about a uh, it's about the bureaucracy and it's also about the private sector that is part of this whole process. So it's a four segmented coordination mechanism that should be there. There's absolutely uh, no problem in doing that. Thirdly, 
very broad points that we can decide that we have to uh, keep debt low, we have to maintain high revenues, we have to try and cut down our input costs, we have to make sure that our regulatory structure is easy, we have to make sure that our tax burden gradually reduces per uh, taxpayer. These are things that, I mean, this is uh, not even, there's no debate in this. You don't need a debate. Even if you had a debate, the answer would be the same. So what I would propose, what I would sense, what I would feel, what I hope for are these basic things. Once you get the ball rolling, then it just becomes part of the whole process. Then as you move up, then you, see you, you work towards interest rates, you work towards forex band rates, you work towards how you're going to, uh, how aggressive your exports should be, how aggressive your imports should be. So that's, that's, I think, a slightly more sophisticated thing for the time being. We need to focus on these things right now. Right. Uh, Dr. Ikramul Haq, what's according uh, to you uh, could be uh, the uh, salient uh, feature primarily in the immediate term when we talk about a charter of economy? Yes, my take will be that, first of all, we should see that uh, people are facing a very high inflation and how we should control inflation because inflation is also taxation without legislation. So primarily uh, our uh, energy sector is so high, it's much uh, ignored, not only much ignored, but also for long years we have failed to uh, reform that. Any country with uh, no um, security of energy and food uh, is not going to progress. So for me, two basic areas we should now concentrate is that we should have food security and we should have energy security. And it is also uh, very important for our national security paradigm. So I will um, prefer that we should sit down or we know what are the details of in economic terms. But if we have to show results, we should concentrate on two areas that we should uh, bring down our inflation and we should solve the energy issue so that by that if we have uh, productivity efficiency in agri sector, uh, and uh, we should we now are importing even uh, floods are of course uh, effective for uh, cotton, but even before floods we have been importing wheat and uh, cotton. Uh, so this is the cause of concern for me as well as. If we talk about any uh, progress and any growth, with this cost of energy, it is not possible. So for me, these two areas are very important. And uh, to begin with, when we say there is a charter of democracy, I should say that should be also a charter for economy. What is a charter for economies? That we should uh, uh, make it our uh, national security policy should be closely uh, linked with our economic policy which is a, we have geoeconomic issues we have other issues but at the uh, home front we should ensure that we are uh, security in uh, our food and energy that is very important uh, right uh, dr ikramula very briefly what uh, could be done in order to increase the exports they play an important role uh, in the national income as well uh, of course uh, at the moment uh, most of our even exports are dependent on our imports. It's 40-45% element even in the sector which is the uh, bringing us more of exports. But uh, the question is that can we uh, really make these imports cheaper because of tax element as well as at import stage. There is a uh, cascading of uh, not less than 30-35% per we take in advance sale tax, we take in advance income tax. So we should seriously think about that, that export we cannot improve unless we have uh, this, this the, uh, the present policies are also uh, export, uh, have export bias. But more than that, uh, I, we should have uh, exportable surplus in areas where we have a competitive edge. We have competitive edge. We used to have competitive edge in agriculture, which is no more there. IT sector is another one. Our youth can be trained. We should expand on human capital development. So this, these are two areas from where we can make uh, quick bugs. And uh, obviously, uh, productivity and uh, efficiency is required because uh, the world is very competitive now. 
and there is demand uh, contraction as well in the world. So be right. competitive, we will have to be very, very uh, cost efficient as well. Right. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, point, uh, Dr. Ikramul Haq, taxation expert, joining us on Skype. We really appreciate uh, your time on Views on News. And we were honored to have been joined in the studio by Mr. Fahim Sardar, Senior Policy Specialist and Senior Economist, Strategic Policy Planning Cell at the National Security Division, Government of Pakistan. Really appreciate your time also. So when we uh, talk about the government's efforts, uh, government is relentlessly working day in and day out to stabilize overall um, outlook of economy in Pakistan but at the same time there should be some sort of responsibility that should be shown from the opposition rather than uh, going for the politics of agitation and rumor mongering it should sit with the government in order to chalk out the charter of economy the government is repeatedly talking about for the larger interest of the country with that note we come to the end of today's views on news until the next one take good care of yourselves